Hello everybody, my name is Patrick McCarthy. I'm Head of Artistic Planning for the Ulster Orchestra um, and we're very grateful to you for joining us again um, for this latest instalment in our series of conversations that we're calling Digital Green Room, where we get a chance to chat to some of our visiting artists, conductors, soloists, uh, but also um, interesting creative people around Northern Ireland that, uh, that we haven't yet worked with um, and may wish to do so in the future um, as we, we use this time coming out of lockdown to think about new creative partnerships um, and to see where that might lead us. So we're really grateful today to Hannah Peel for joining us uh, in this conversation. So Hannah, um, multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, arranger, um, Radio 3 presenter, 6 Music presenter, what have I missed? Uh, there must be, <laughs> must be some other things in there. And it, finding out a little bit uh, about you over the last few weeks, it, it seems to me you are a kind of perfect exemplar of a, of a 21st century musician. Someone who is able to exist in so many different worlds uh, at the same time and be able to sort of dis bestride all of these different genres and different mediums in a way that I'm going to say 30 years ago someone like you didn't exist, someone doing the range of different things. Um, how do you manage to balance all these all these different <laughs> things at once? Yeah it's quite difficult <laughs> but I think um, you're right it wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to do what I'm doing and it wouldn't have been accepted so freely 30 years ago. I think there was a certain like phrase like, uh, you know, the kind of master of none mm. <laughs> uh, kind of phrase where, you know, you, you drift about, but I, I don't see it like that. I see music as a career and you kind of had to be a little bit entrepreneurial in terms of what you do, especially if you want to be working in music full time and have a lifelong career, which is what I've always done. And I've come to accept over the last 10 years or so that just doing one thing doesn't excite me. Like I love to be inspired by different forms of creation, whether it be for media or theatre or orchestral or classical or electronic. And that works for me in that I can move around. I think there's definitely a sound that I create and a, and a world that I create, like a sound world almost. And there is always a narrative to every piece. Um, you know, even with Radio 3 night tracks pre like presenting on that, there is definitely a kind of ethos around everything. So I'm not coming at it and going, right, I'm going to do a jazz thing now and I'm going to do this. It's very much of the same kind of elk. But yeah, I mean, managing time is quite difficult. Um, but I've got a lovely team around me that help and you know producers or my manager and I think that you know finding that balance has taken a long time but it's it's definitely working. Mm. It's, it's a lovely model that you describe one where where one piece of work maybe sort of feeds into another or at least there, there's a sort of there's a, a unanimity to to what you you do uh, mm. and with so do you do you sort of have a an explicit sense of that 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 maybe there's, there's something that occurs to you in one genre that you, you then take through to a different part of your output. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, there's a lot more openness these days. I guess with all digital kind of platforms and streaming, there's, there's a lot more scope. You're not kind of stuck to just a physical thing or a written piece of paper. There is a, there is a way to kind of mould things and create stuff. And I think that's, I think that's a beautiful thing that we have in life right now that we need to embrace and take forward that it's not just like you are just a jazz musician and you are going to do this it is very much about experimenting and collaborating and I guess one of the things that I've always done from you know from being a child is collaborated played with my friends written music with my friends gone on tour with people I know and it, that's always stayed with me so you know to do like work with like the likes of Paul Weller or OOMD, completely different sound worlds, but it's still a collaboration, it's still music, it's still something that gets you excited. Mm, mm. And I think, I mean, from the Ulster Orchestra's point of view, I think we are, we have found over lockdown that we are at our best when we're being collaborative. 
uh, and not just in the in the conventional sense of a visiting soloist and a visiting conductor. And of course, they bring new perspectives, and that's that's energising in itself. But some of the things that we've done over the last year have have sort of kind of elevated our own expectations, I think, of, of what we can and even what we should be producing mm -hmm. um, in a way that's, that's hopefully interesting to audiences and really energising for us and, and for our musicians. So there's, there's so many good things that, that have come out of, out of this period. Uh, and again, the idea that, that we're all working now in different medium. I mean, what we're doing now and the way that we present the orchestra now in this, this series of digital concerts. Yeah, it's very um, important. It, it is, mm. and, and it's, we challenge ourselves to do it to the same sort of level as we would for, for an orchestral performance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what a crazy time. Uh, <laughs> how's it been for you? I, I have a sense you've been busier than ever, um, uh, yeah, whilst maybe whilst busier. live things haven't been happening. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I kind of stepped back from doing live about three or four months before we went into the first lockdown. So it did give me a little bit of kind of freedom to carry on what I was doing in terms of the radio shows were kept going and, and I, they got more frequent through lockdown because people were wanting more radio. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it also gave me time to sit back. I was commissioned by the Para Orchestra, who are based in Bristol, who combine disabled and non-disabled professional musicians. And they'd commissioned me a couple of years ago to write something, and it had taken lockdown to have that time to finally sit and go, right, I'm going to write this piece for them. And, you know, we'll, we hope to present that next year, or maybe by the end of 2021, we'll see. But, you know, those kind of things, I think, have allowed me to be able to kind of sit and reassess and I think that's with most people you know even if you've lost quite a lot of work which a lot of us have you still had time to reflect and focus on what is the most important thing and what do you want out of this and I guess as far as kind of you know I guess you know as far as maybe the orchestra is concerned that kind of thing you maybe not it's not kind of viable to just put on just classical concerts anymore you have to have an open mind because audiences are getting younger and they want more experiences and more immersion and to be excited by something to combine like the skills of somebody who's had so much incredible training with a different form of music is is very exciting to a lot of people and very inspiring yeah uh, that's been a common theme through some of these conversations actually about uh, about freedom and about risk uh, and that's risk taking both for musicians and maybe for your audiences as well and again it, it's something that feeds into the fact that we're dealing in a different medium at the moment and maybe the level of risk for an audience member involved in going to a concert where, where maybe you don't know what it's going to be. Mm. Uh, it's different maybe to getting in the car and going into Belfast and having dinner before. It's a different sort of, it's a different investment. And maybe with that slightly reduced investment um, comes a, a greater appetite for risk. I, yeah. I hope. I, no, I, I agree. I think it's, and you, you know, even doing night tracks, I mean, it's a late night show, but the fact that we combine and and mould different, you know, around the world, different types of music mm. and with a certain kind of like sound world around it. So it doesn't feel like it's kind of just come out of nowhere. I mean, all the tracks yeah, are yeah, segued yeah, yeah. and beautifully put together. But, you know, it does, it's done really well in that sense. Like people want to listen to it, not just at night, but during the day. And the fact that it, it is risk taking, it's not like as kind of wild as Late Junction, um, which is now on a Friday night, but you know, it definitely opens people's minds and the amount of kind of comments and feedback we've had for that radio show is, is pretty mind blowing. And, you know, I feel very proud to be a part of it. Mm. I, I guess one of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing for lots of reasons, but especially at the moment, uh, it's the intimacy of, of radio, isn't it? That, uh, and then at a time when people have not been able to connect with each other in the same way uh, physically, then then they're connecting and, and investing much more in their relationship with what they what they listen to, uh, yeah. and long may that continue. But um, uh, tell us a little bit more, if you would, about about your your journey through. So, you're born in Northern Ireland, grew up in England, 
but now based back uh, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, just tell us a bit about how you've ended up uh, back here and what it was like maybe your early musical experiences uh, yeah growing up. I guess my grandfather was a organist and a choir master in um, in Lurgan in Armagh actually in Armagh Cathedral as well so I had that background of always being surrounded by a lot of choral music and a lot of classical music as well um, uh, but when we moved to England, it was very much to do with the folk side of things, like actually because Barnsley, where we moved to, is very much in the folk world. You've got kind of the likes of Kate Rusby. Mm, mm. Um, and my father plays guitar and sings, you know, folk songs and things. So it was very much immersed in that world and the tradition of colliery brass bands. So I learned to play the cornet and then moved on to the trombone and spent all my teenage life marching around fields and in competitions and um, and yeah ended up in Liverpool studied music there at Paul McCartney's Performing Arts College because I wanted to do something that wasn't just on my instrument I wanted to be immersed with kind of dancers and actors and be in recording studios and and I loved that side of things and from then living in London I just decided that I wanted to have more space <laughs> and you can't really do that in London. Mm, mm. So I wanted to have a studio that was near to me so I could work more and be by the sea. So I moved back to Northern Ireland and, you know, all my family are now here. It's just an anomaly that I've got a Yorkshire accent still. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I've embraced it. I think when I first moved back, in fact, I bought my house three years today. So. You know, I was conscious that I didn't have a Northern Irish accent, and now I'm just, I don't even think about it anymore. So, <laughs> no. I've got used um, to it. Let me take you back to Yorkshire then and just pick up on the, on the brass band thing and what that gave you, because I, I, I came through the, the same sort of thing. I came through school brass bands, but then uh, innumerable colliery bands, and where I came from, Burton on Trent, brewery brass bands. Um, and what a rich thing that is. And I mean, I can list off 10 things that it kind of gave me as a musician, but what sort of grounding did it, did it give you? What were the benefits of coming up through that, that system? Because it is a, a sort of system of its own, isn't it? Yes, and very competitive actually. And, and, uh, and I think that was always something that was kind of put into my mindset of being, I guess like, you know, you're competitive, but you're working to, together as a group, you're breathing together, you are as one solid body. And if you're not, then you stand out like a sore thumb. And I think that teaches you a lot of things. Also the culture around it, the history, tradition, the stories, the fact that these incredible musicians really don't care about doing it during the day. It is their nighttime thing mm -hmm. and they work and have a passion for it. And I think that's a really, incredible thing also probably taught me how to drink quite early <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, like you know now i hardly drink at all and I, I do think it's because i was like surrounded by people that were a lot older it and big thing. drinkers yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah i think that mirrors my own experience with with brass bands and um, what you talk about about that that requirement to play in an ensemble style uh, mm. and not sticking out is something that that sort of stayed with me uh, as a musician through throughout everything I've, I've done and to actually almost sort of prioritize that ensembleness over everything else with the possible exception of if I say lyricism the way that that a band kind of shapes a, a melody together mm. in this sort of overtly expressive way mm. um, and you hear that now I mean you will know all, all the, the um, UK orchestral brass musicians that have come through that same line and you can hear it in their playing as soon as, as someone yeah. like James Fountain or previously Morris Murphy or Phil Cobb or someone like that starts playing then instantly you know what sound world you're in yeah and to to have that as a distinctive characteristic of a, of a British orchestra I think it's such a precious thing and I, I hope we we never lose it yeah, I, I hope so too, because it is very British. You know, you know where you are when you hear a brass band play. Mm, mm, mm. But it is, I, I think the thing that excited me about brass bands and actually playing the trombone was that you were part of the low end of that. And you got the real kind of buzz of that feeling of when, you know, the, the sound and the power of the sound. I mean, there's nothing that can kind of emulate that 
Mm. And um, the album that I did with uh, a brass band called Chibla Brass, which is kind of like, kind of uh, pocketed kind of players from around the whole of Britain, really, and put that with synthesizers. There was this like really magical thing when we did it live, like that you couldn't really place. It was like almost like the, the kind of like the sub of the synthesizers and the kind of high end frequency and then the sonorous richness of the brass band in the center just it honestly like just made your stomach kind of go Ooh, like it's so like warm and rich and yeah, you know people yeah, did cry yeah. quite a lot because then you know you're hearing as well a brass band mic'd up it's not just kind of being lost to the atmosphere and it is something very very special yeah mm. yeah I, I look forward to to getting back to my brass band roots one of these <laughs> days but there we are um and what about uh, what about things coming up you've just had a new album come out yeah um and i'm sure you're busy promoting that at the moment but but looking further ahead uh what do the next few months uh, look like as far as you can as far as you can determine yeah i mean it's always the case that you can't really talk about these things sometimes when you sign ndas and stuff <laughs> of course, but, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah the album the electronic album that's just come out that was reworking um a 1972 record uh, called Electrosonic, which is um, was put out by KPM 1000 series. It's like a library album uh, collection, and that involved Delia Derbyshire and some of the members of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Mm. And they gave me permission to take that and do what I wanted with it. Wow. So I yeah. created a kind of, it's almost classical in some ways. It's got a lot of lyrical notes to it it's not necessarily just beat driven and, and electronic synth driven that um, the sounds themselves are very organic and i think that's something that i always try and do anyway is blend the organic sound of electronic music with acoustic instruments because i don't see any difference mm. in them mm. i think they should be blended together and part of an ensemble um and I, I don't know why I think that, but I just think it just adds, it's another instrument, it's an energy, it's electricity. It's, it's, just, it's a case, there is a case to be made, I think, for it. So mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting how you talk about that and how you, you seek to combine those. Because I think there is an audience, and maybe even part of, of myself thinks, there's something about uh, a person and a live instrument which instantly transmits which maybe doesn't with, with beats and with, with synth sounds. Yeah. So uh, I think I, I yeah, can see Yeah, because you're a... playing an instrument that, especially the analog kind of stuff, you're, you're playing it as you would a violin. Like you are molding, the, you're shaping the sound, you're moving with volumes, with filters, in order to create a bigger sound or a tinier sound. It's like, it, it's, it is a, a skill in itself. And I think it's really, I think if you can find the balance, what I don't like is when you get like kind of, orchestras and it's chucked against kind of electronic stuff and it just it doesn't work i think there's always a way to kind of make it work mm. and think about it more more fully but yeah so i've written a piece um i was talking about the para orchestra so that will hopefully we'll tour with that or do something with that this year and that is very much along because of the skills of the individuals that are involved in the orchestra that they're very into embracing a lot of more electronic sounds because of the disabilities mm. that mm you know, very unique. So um, so it, we've done this magical piece that combines a lot of electronic and classical in a way that is only unique to them. And I think that's really exciting and it's, a, it's going to be a beautiful record when it's finished. Um, so that's going to happen. And then I've got a couple of like a documentary for Netflix and some TV shows and stuff coming up. So it's going to be a full yeah, for sure. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Well, we hope uh, at some point to be able to just turn over uh, this body of musicians to you and, and, oh, and let that. you loose and we'll, we'll find something exciting and, oh, and meaningful yeah. to do together in, in due course. But, but for now, Hannah, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks ever so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks Thank for having you. me. Cheers.